Thank you. So, uh, like Agnieszka said, I work for the Division of Reclamation, Mining, and Safety. And for every ton of coal that is mined in the state, the Office of Surface Mining takes that money and puts it in a pot. And then they hand that money out to the states um, that have coal mining in them to complete coal mining reclamation. And so Colorado gets a portion of this funding. And so in turn, the Division of Reclamation, Mining, and Safety does a lot of reclamation at coal sites. And that's probably one of our first and foremost um, jobs at Division of Reclamation, Mining, and Safety, or it's the one that started us. It was our bread and butter. And so um, in recent years, in Drango and in the San Juan Coal Basin, we've done less, we, we've done a lot of coal reclamation in the past at these abandoned coal mine sites and in the 80s. And in recent years, we've done less. But we've seen a slight resurgence lately with needing to revisit some of these sites that we've done reclamation on in the past. And that fits in with this, this tie-in of like the evolution of reclamation and the evolution of the site. And so when I was asked to talk about coal mine reclamation, I had to decide what to talk about because in the past three years, we've done three projects. And they've all been um, really interesting. And we've put out a coal mine fire on the Southern Ute Reservation where we just, um, a coal mine caught fire and we dug it up and, and cooled it off. And a very interesting project was a, a coal mine fire started um, due to the Weber fire near Mancus. And so under that project, we, um, the forest fire moved across Menifee Mountain and started, a bunch, started some coal mines on fire. <laughs> And so we dug those up and cooled those off. And while those are interesting projects, just because there's fire and flames and heat, and, uh, and a lot of money was spent and a lot of different equipment, um, I think that the, the most fitting one to talk about would be the Boston Mine Erosion Control Project. It's a project that shows how, us, how this reclamation has changed through time and how the needs of the site are changing through time um, due to just environmental changes or even just slight changes on a site can change the needs of, of reclamation. So we're going to talk about the Boston Mine Erosion Control Project. Slide. And uh, it was a success and we're talking about it today because it used some different new techniques to reclaim. Um, we're talking about it because we shared technologies with other agencies and other groups and we had collaborative partnerships with Mountain Studies Institute and, and uh, Southwest Conservation Corps and local entities and, and Fort Lewis College. We're talking about it because um, we believe that this showed a shift in how we reclaim from large scale by the acre plowing a site under and, and um, seeding to uh, looking at reclamation on a small scale and preserving even singular clumps of grass and, and really changing our amendment for each area depending on, on what we see, in, see on the ground. So taking it from the acre size down to the square foot, let's design it by the square foot now. And uh, we're also talking about the successes of preserving the site for the wildlife and uh, preserving the history on the site. And then once again, our partnerships on this site were so important and that was one of our goals for reclaiming this site, um, this coal mine site, was to involve the community. Slide. So I'm going to start by talking about the Boston mine itself. We're going to talk about the history of the Boston mine, just because it's really interesting and ties into the San Juans. We're going to talk about acid mine drainage, and luckily I don't need to go over um, all the details. <laughs> Devin, wherever you are. And, uh, We'll talk about the project that, uh, at the time, the Division of Minerals and Geology completed in 1992. And then we'll talk, of, so we used to be the Division of Minerals and Geology, and now we're Division of Reclamation, Mining, and Safety. So I'll say DRMS, so to shorten it because it's a mouthful. And uh, then we'll talk about the 2013 Erosion Control Project, which I think was a huge success. Slide. So the Boston Mine is located in the San Juan Mountains. 
It is located right outside of Durango, Colorado, on the back side of Parents Peak. Um, if you've ever gone up Leitner Creek to access the Colorado Trail, you've driven past it. It's located on Colorado Parks and Wildlife property. So this site is preserved for wildlife. Um, that's its main purpose, is to preserve the site for wildlife, and it happens to have a mine on it. So the Boston Mine, also known as the Perrins Peak Number 1, is an abandoned coal mine. It was mined from the turn of the century to about 1926. It mined the Menifee Formation of the Mesa Verde Group, for all the geologists out there. And, uh, it, uh, the coal ranged from about two feet to eight feet thick, and there remains on site about 4,000 cubic yards of coal waste. So coal waste is similar to, to the hard rock mine waste that we see. It's just the, the waste from mining the coal that wasn't good enough to burn, not a high enough carbon content to go to the train or to go to the smelter to help. So this, this site supplied the train and the smelter to smelt the minerals that we got from Silverton and and, and uh, mostly from Silverton. And uh, um, once again, owned by Parks and Wildlife, so we're trying to protect the wildlife on this site. Uh, there's the rocks. Um, the Menifee Formation has coal in it, and so that's what we were mining. The Point Lookout sandstone is one of those uh, notable features, so you could track it across. It's that same, same type of rock unit that you see there at Mesa Verde um, sticking out, the Point Lookout. Here's a historic picture of the site that I got off the internet somewhere showing a rail grade and showing um, there is a, a mine car um, slope that goes up, up the slope here and goes underground. And, and a lot of these remnants are still preserved on site. So the history of the site was really important to us to preserve. This is the town site of Perrins. Little known fact, there is a huge town up there right behind Durango. So here is a, a mine car that's still on site. And you can still see the remnants of the old rail grade that went into the mine. And so it's just, it's neat to see the history of the site. A mine map. Um, this is showing the entry where the mine cars go up near the tipple here into the, into the mountain and then showing uh, areas that are burned out and worked out. And so, yeah. so what we were getting in the, for the acid mine drainage, which we'll talk about next, is we're getting water backing up against this, this outcrop here, which is not a portal, and coming out. So we're getting acid mine drainage out of this coal mine site. Uh, acid mine drainage, pyrite oxygen water equals acid mine drainage. We'll just boil it down. So, the odd thing about this coal site is we're used to acid mine drainage here in the San Juans coming out of these hard rock mine sites, mining gold and silver, but we're not used to thinking about acid mine drainage from coal mine sites, at least not in the West. So this is a really unique site. It's not, we don't see acid mine drainage coming from other coal mines, even in the immediate vicinity. So this is a real unique place where there happens to be a little bit more pyrite in the coal and we get some acid mine drainage. And along with that, some other um, minerals contributing zinc and copper and manganese. And uh, the pH of the water was two and a half, is two, was two and a half and still is. Um, so we think that somehow water was getting into these mine, mine workings through a collapsed mine working in a drainage. So water was coming down the drainage entering the mine workings and getting backed up against the outcrop and coming out about 10 to 25 gallons a minute of this low pH high metals water. So the focus in the 90s was let's deal with this, deal with this water and get rid of our, our uh, metals problems on the site. So it, the, the flow was even so high that sometimes it reached 20 gallons a minute all the way down a mile from the site down entering Leitner Creek and, and had orange flowing uh, just similar to the hard rock drainage, orange water coming from the site, which is that um, iron precipitates coming out of the water, making it, discoloring it. So in 1992, School of Mines and Bureau of Mines and the Division of Minerals and Geology all got together and decided 
um, to support the School of Mines effort to install a sulfate-reducing bioreactor, which once again, Devin talked about. And uh, that's just an upflow treatment system that uses, um, let's uh, move on to the next one. It's an upflow treatment system that uses limestone and organic matter and usually gravel for hydraulic conductivity to treat water, to make it anoxic, to precipitate metal sulfides out. And uh, when you do that, then you get rid of your metals. They're trapped in that, in that cell at that point. So in 1992, we did just that. We put in a French drain, we collected the water, we sent it down to a sulfate-reducing bioreactor cell on the site, and uh, started treating water. And we used, for this, just for interest sake, we used mushroom compost as our, as our carbon source. And uh, we saw that this site was working in 1992 and maybe 1993, and it was raising the pH and removing metals. Um, at that same time that we did this project, we closed a portal in the, in the drainage. And uh, this was a collapse into the mine workings that we filled with foam. And then we covered with dirt. So we essentially got rid of the hole so it could no longer capture water. Here's a schematic of the site showing the crown hole, showing the seepage area, and then showing the wetland treatment. And uh, next, aerial photo um, showing the same thing. Uh, a more recent aerial photo flown by us showing the 4,000 cubic yards of coal waste, showing some existing ponds that were there. Um, you know, I, I was, I'm guessing maybe in the, they were installed even maybe in 1920. But uh, ponds to catch sediment were already there for us. They're filling up fast. The acid mine drainage seep area. And there's a lot of severe erosion coming off of this area now, after 1992. There's the wetland treatment cell all filled with sediment. And here's Steve standing out. We're looking at the site. We went out there from about 2010. We started going out there and, and looking at the site. And we'd heard that, um, that there was a lot of severe erosion issues. And there's a, a dry pond. Uh, the acid seep area showing a bunch of salt crust, but not, a bun not any flow now. Acid seep area again, even early in the spring, and showing no flow. And um, still, it's pretty dry. So sometime between 1993 and the present, the site completely changed. And uh, there's no more water at the site. We go up there, and maybe we saw five, gallon min five gallons per minute once. And uh, typically, we see no, no water. So there's no reason to have a wetland treatment system anymore, or a sulfate-reducing bioreactor. And um, we think maybe the closure of that, that crown hole caused the water to go away from the workings no longer getting trapped against the outcrop. So severe erosion, exposed pipes, just down cutting, broken pipe. That's just showing salt crust because it's pretty. And uh, the wet, wetland treatment cell filled completely with sediment, you know, two or three feet and just overflowing and down cutting. And so this is where our partnerships come in. And Mountain Studies came in, and they started running vegetation trials for us. They uh, ran vegetation trials using biochar and compost and limestone also. And they amended it at different ratios and gave us a recipe to decide uh, what to amend with at this site. And so biochar is, is basically a piece of charcoal burned in a low oxygen environment with a, a distinct structure that allows for water retention and has other added benefits of a, of a higher pH and uh, sequesters carbon. Then we used compost. Compost at the site happened to be local. We didn't want to use manure because we didn't want to introduce weeds to the site. So we used beer mash from Steamworks and uh, wood chips. And uh, so, you know, biochar is becoming less innovative, but it's still being used as a soil amendment. So we considered that kind of an innovative step in using that at the site. And then the real innovation, though, came from um, the technology sharing that we did with the New Mexico Man and Mineland Group. They're not here today, but they provided 
some new and exciting dry land reclamation techniques that they've been using just across the border, like in Raton, in their coal basins. And so we adapted those and, and started using those in Colorado, which um, were big on sharing between the different states and the different entities. So we were able to do that. Um, and then we changed the revegetation perspective from the big scale plowing acres under to, to looking at each separate area and leaving even small clumps, clumps of grass standing and not, not plowing them under. And so we did a lot of work by hand at the site. Um, so in 2013, we started the project. It was funded by Office of Surface Mining and the, and the tax on every ton of coal that's mined. And uh, it's on the Colorado Parks and Wildlife property, so here's a horny toad. <laughs> we're protecting him. And, uh, and we're also protecting, their main focus is peregrine falcons and elk. But, um, so we revegetated five acres. And, next. and uh, the specific soil amendment was two and a half tons of biochar and four tons of compost per acre. And then we mixed that into the top eight inches of soil. And uh, we had to hand deliver it up the slope, so that was winches and pulleys and then hand mixing and leaving even just tiny clumps of vegetation standing and working around whatever was there um, due to this fragile desert environment that we were working in. And then we included limestone on the, the acid areas. So here we are mixing biochar and compost, getting ready to take it up the hill. There it is, it's pretty dark black. Um, here we are mixing it into the acid area, so we have some limestone spread out too. Uh, more limestone getting mixed in. And then, so straw wattle land stabilization, this is what we borrowed from New Mexico. So this is where every two foot vertically we placed a straw tube on contour across the slope. So you imagine every two foot there's a straw wattle on the slope. And uh, behind that straw wattle we made a little flat area. And behind those flat areas that's where we had a microclimate for shade and water and mulch to, um, cap to help the plants um, get a better establishment. And uh, the positive thing about these straw wattles is they can leave the site as uh, the landform as it was with the coal waste piles and the history of the site, and they degrade with time, and then they, they're not, so they're not disrupting much. That's what it looks like in GIS version. And uh, then we also mulched the site. The entire site was mulched, and we had to hand mulch it and hand crimp it because we'd already put the straw wattles down. So our, our contractor on this site, RMC Consultants, was excellent. They do a lot of work for a lot, of, a lot of the people in this room, and they did a great job. Here they are hand crimping. We also installed check dams in the drainage. So here's the drainage before. It was down cut like four feet since 1992. So we came in and put these check dams in. And, and they're working now and they're backing up sediment and it will hopefully fill the channel back in as, it, as we get more storm events. We also had to do a mine safety closure, also in the drainage, another hole in the drainage, so I'm hoping that after we filled this one with foam and covered it with dirt, that we'll get even less water entering the mine. We had to be worried about bats, and so we put a tube in it that sticks above the surface and uh, doesn't capture water though. <clears throat> And so there's the air shaft with a, a closure in it. And so tree planting. We planted 20,000 live trees and shrubs. And uh, that's a lot. Conservation, seeding, and restoration um, grew them all for us in the spring, and then we planted them in the fall. So we planted mostly Gamble's oak, because that's what we saw growing on the site. And, uh, but also sagebrush, ponderosa, and mountain mahogany. And we're finding that they're all kind of surviving. Um, similarly, they're all doing really well. Of course, the sagebrush is like taking over. But so we had then another partnership that we brought in was the Southwest Conservation Corps. We brought them in. Um, they're a group that does work for cheap, provides a lot of labor. They educate their their core members and come out with a positive experience to impact their lives. And so they planted 20,000 trees in eight days with the help of conservation, seeding, and restoration, doing watering and helping move materials and heavy equipment. 
And then uh, we also brought in Fort Lewis College, which is one of our goals at the initiation of this project, to, um, to bring them in. So we had the geology students come up, and they learned about the site, and then they helped plant trees for an hour. There's all the trees and shrubs and little tubes and volunteers. And so our partnerships, that was one of the successes of this, is partnering with Mountain Studies and the Conservation Corps and Fort Lewis and uh, partnering with Parks and Wildlife to give them what they needed on the site to protect wildlife instead of uh, just making that the focus of the project. And of course, Office of Surface Mining for giving us money and our contractor, RMC, and uh, our other contractor, uh, Conservation Seeding Restoration. So here's a core member planting trees. Here's what it looked like um, with almost all of them planted. So they're really close together. And the surprising thing is we're seeing like 60% survival. And that's really high. And uh, so we're happy. <laughs> My daughter, volunteer. <laughs> and so here's an aerial photo. I don't know if this is going to show up too well. But here's an aerial photo before. And then in Google Earth after, you can see all the little squiggles on there. So it's, it's pretty intense and, uh, and different. And so we're proud of the project. Are there any questions? Actually, I actually had two questions. I was wondering how long the phone lasts. And um, I saw you put in check cams. I was wondering if you'd ever heard Bill Zedike's work on controlling erosion. Uh, I have not heard of Bill Zedike or his work on controlling erosion. It's really good stuff. You gotta check it out. Feel free to talk to me afterwards. Okay. And I forgot the other question. Foam. How long does the foam. foam last, I don't know. What do my other colleagues think on foam? A long time, 100 years. Should we just throw that out? Anybody? Sure. <laughs> it's, a, you know, it's like a plastic. It's going to last for a long time as long as you keep it covered with dirt. If it gets uncovered, then it starts to photodegrade. Did your... Oh, sorry. <laughs> your your 20,000 plants that you planted, any sort of uh, irrigation in those plants, or is that just now a natural rainfall? That yeah, we watered them when we first put them in, and now it's just natural. Water them for just once. Once. Just once, right? When we planted them to give them a the little right kickstart. Really, I guess, the soil to get that sixty percent. Yeah, I think that um, we were at a tipping point on this coal waste. It happened to be um, pretty, you know. Although we saw acid issues coming out of the outcrop, we did not see acid issues in the coal waste pile, which is weird. And, or the coal, re yeah, the coal waste pile. And uh, I think it was kind of at a tipping point where just a little bit of organics and stuff got it going. And you used uh, spent beer, uh, hops, and, and uh, barley? Yeah. Did you have to encourage people in Durango to drink beer? Well, I, when, I guess when you go to Steamworks, they don't need any encouragement. <laughs> they go through a lot of beer there. <laughs> Was there any mixing of straw wattles? I mean, any kind of uh, myco uh, uh, materials or anything like that? Mushroom or uh, mycelia, for example? No, we did not use that. Uh -huh. No mushroom compost or different. Uh, Where what you mentioned uh, mycelia at one point, I thought. Did I? Or no. something about mushroom compost. Or oh, mushroom compost. You're right, yeah. we did. Um, mushroom compost was in the wetland treatment or the sulfate reducing bioreactor as the organic matter. Okay. Yeah. Kind of a, a weird, different purpose. Did you do any uh, geochemistry or spectrographic analysis of the cold source, or did you have the history studies from the cold source? Uh, we or did that? not do any of that. We just sampled the water and the coal waste. Who was your plant supplier? Conservation, seeding, and restoration. Oh, so okay. they grew them all for us. They grew them in. Yeah. Okay. Are they in Durango? They are in Rifle. They were formerly Colorado uh, or Rocky Mountain native plants, if you guys remember that. Yeah. You first. Can you talk a little bit more about the bats? Okay, so uh, we didn't have time to do a survey on this this specific air shaft, but we felt airflow, and the Colorado Parks and Wildlife is really concerned about wildlife. So we just decided to go ahead and maintain airflow in that mine in case bats should want to use it. Oh. And the foam does not affect? No, it, the pipe goes down and is surrounded by foam, but it doesn't cover the end or anything. So it doesn't hurt them. Or What month did you plant all those trees? We planted them in 
late September, early October. That's good. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Kirsten. I think we have fun.